In short, on March 12, 1911, in Kiev on the way to school, disappeared 12-year-old boy Andrew Yushchinsky. The disappearance of the child was not noticed immediately. Parents, mother, and stepfather did not take care of their son. On March 20th, the boy's body was found in a small cave in the suburbs of Kiev. He was sitting with his hands tied and wearing only underwear. It was possible to identify Andre only thanks to the notebooks lying next to him. Three versions of the crime appeared. The first is blood libel. The murder of the boy is part of a Jewish ritual on the eve of a religious holiday. The version was supported by anti-Semitic citizens and activists of Black Hundred organizations. The second is inheritance. There was an assumption that the murderer of Andrei Yushchensky was his parents. The stepfather wanted to take from the boy a large sum of money, which allegedly left his father. Third, Andriusha Yushchensky was killed by criminals. The boy had a friend, Zhenya, whose mother, Vera Shebriak, had connections in the criminal environment. She was the owner of a den of thieves, herself bought and sold stolen goods, harbored criminals, and her brother was known as a professional thief. One day the boys quarreled, and Andre said that he would tell about his mother's dark deeds. The expert examination established that the boy was inflicted 47 stab wounds. The corpse was exsanguinated. The last fact stirred up the whole town. It was the basis for the first theory. Rumors spread around the city that it was a ritual murder and was committed by Jews who needed blood to make matzah for the Jewish holiday Pesach, the Jewish Passover. Under pressure from the public, who largely believed the murder to be ritualistic and committed by Jews, the investigation focused its energies on this version of the murder. Vladimir Golubev, student chairman of the Two-Headed Eagle Society, conducted his own independent investigation. Having studied the territory near the crime scene, Golubev found the murderer. He was the clerk Mendel Bayless. Most likely, Golubev was not so much looking for a criminal as for a Jew who lived or was nearby, and found Bayless. At the end of July 1911, the suspect was arrested. Mendel Bayless served as a clerk at a brickyard near Kiev. Mendel raised five children and worked from morning to night. He took any job to feed his family and provide his children with a good education. Belly's relations with his neighbors were mostly friendly. His reputation was so good that even during the Jewish pogroms of 1905, the Black Hundreds assured that he had nothing to fear. With each passing day, the criminal investigation turned into a political game. It appeared that the investigation, which was under pressure from the public right, was not so much looking into the case searching for the real murderer as looking for a Jew suitable for the role of a murderer. The Bayless case resonated not only in the Russian Empire. The whole world rose to the defense of Bayless. In Great Britain, the United States, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and France, professors, journalists, and writers openly opposed the prosecution. On October 28, 1913, Kiev became the object of world attention. On that day, the jury had to reach a verdict against the defendant, Bayless. They deliberated for a little over an hour and a half. The atmosphere in the courtroom was heavy, and everything was nearing the end.